Hello scholars, welcome to Geology 5, and in today's lecture we will be introducing the world's oceans, talking about just how cool they are, why we should be interested, and then also what do we know about them as far as the different parts, components, and how do we classify? Let's get into it. So our objectives for today's lecture are as follows. Understand why oceans are important. Really fundamentally, why are the oceans important? We'll get into it. Identify the names and locations of the major oceans. We will look at average depths of oceans. We will identify marine provinces, look at the features of a continental margin, and then also identify and understand zones in marine environments. Lots of cool stuff. Let's get in it. So, why oceanography? As we see here, this image, this satellite image of Earth from outer space is predominantly blue. It's called the blue planet. And oceanographers try and understand everything that's going on in this part of our planet that we call the oceans. And this is important for marine biologists and environmental scientists and chemists and physical oceanographers and geographers, and it is the intersection of so many sciences. Biology. Life started in the oceans and then evolved onto land. Everything is connected to the ocean in one way or another. And so in order to understand anything, we need to have a firm foundation in what's going on in our oceans. So why? because understanding our oceans is vital to understanding our Earth. Oceans are a major contributor to climate. The oceans and the atmosphere are uh, integrally linked together. And if it weren't for the oceans, we wouldn't have a stable climate. We wouldn't have oxygen to breathe. We wouldn't be here. So thank you, oceans, for supporting our lives. Uh, oceans provide resources from oil and gas, to food, fish, seafood that we can eat, to alternative sources of energy, which is of great value as we move into this next uh, segment of humanity out of the oil age and into the alternative energy age. We'll need a very diverse portfolio of energy supplies. And so looking to the ocean, wind power, wave power, tidal power. There's a lot of opportunities for the oceans to help us reach these more environmentally friendly uh, solutions for the energy crisis. Oceans connect us across the globe through international trade, which helps us to collaborate and develop ideas and innovate in technologies, again, that are going to help us solve some of the world's biggest problems that we will be facing in the years to come. This is the importance of diversity, having diverse groups of individuals to bring their respective uh, cultural ideas and thoughts and worldviews in a way that we can work together and have these great ideas and reach these amazing solutions. Recreation, fishing, surfing, sailing, maybe you just like to hang out on the beach and dip your toes in the sand, go for a swim uh, every now and again if the weather's warm enough. So oceanography is important because we like the ocean and we want to have fun and understand it. Also, there's mysteries of the ocean. We only know about 5 to 10 percent of what's there. There's a whole frontier of exploration waiting to be had. And it might be you. You might be the world's next foremost oceanographer following in the footsteps of Sylvia Earle, an amazing scientist who has led the field of oceanography for many, many years. Okay, so when we look at the blue planet, we see that Earth's oceans dominate the surface. They are the major feature. They're the largest habitat there where life started. Everything is connected to the oceans. And Earth has a long history 
in connection. There weren't oceans when it first formed, but very soon after density stratification and the late heavy bombardment came in, brought a bunch of ice, boom, smashing into the earth, and then the surface of the earth cooled, so it wasn't all just molten fire and lava. This is around 4 billion years ago. We'll see this in a uh, video. Where did Earth's water come from? Really cool. I think you'll love it. Um, since then, the oceans have been a pivotal key player, a very important system, subsystem of the Earth system. So some highlights. The oceans cover 71% of the surface of the Earth. Land covers 29%. Oceans cover an area of 139 square miles, or million square miles. Not square miles, 139, that's not that much. 139 million square miles, that's so much. I can't even fathom what that even number means. This next number too, they contain a volume of over 1.3 cubic a uh, billion with a b billion cubic kilometers of water again i can't fathom what that means but it's a lot of water there's so much water in the oceans not only do oceans cover the uh, entire earth 71 percent but they are the deepest and the biggest geographic features on the earth and to sum that up I have this video it is attached underneath videos there's a page right now I recommend pausing the lecture going into canvas opening up how big is the oceans and then giving this a watch when you are complete please come back resume with the lecture thank you so assuming that you've just done that here we are Moving on, and what I hope you got out of that video is, wow, the oceans are so big, the deepest area of the world, the biggest geographic feature, the longest mountain range. There's so much water, the oceans are massive, and it is awesome. Okay, so let's get into some more details. The Earth has one ocean. No, the Earth has four oceans. No, the Earth has five. Wait a second, can we just agree how many oceans does the Earth have? Well, it's like this. There's no boundaries. It's not like driving out of state where, welcome to Arizona. Hey, you've made it to Oregon. Hooray, welcome to California. That doesn't happen. In fact, ocean waters are all connected because they all mix between surface and subsurface, subsurface currents that cycle globally in a process called thermohaline circulation. We will dive into thermohaline circulation, don't you worry. But then continents get in the way. So we've got some continents here giving us the Pacific Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, the Indian Ocean, and the Arctic Ocean. But there's an ocean in the bottom, maybe, the Southern Ocean, which is basically where the Indian, the Pacific, and the Atlantic mix. Science is awesome. Everything is falsifiable. Ideas are allowed to be updated and shifted and changed. So we have the four ocean concept. We also have this new emerging idea of the fifth ocean. Depending on what textbook, what news article you read, you will see uh, varying uh, information. Four oceans, five oceans, it's kind of one ocean. So let's just go with this for now. In our comparison, we'll look at four oceans. The Pacific, the world's biggest ocean. Over half of the oceans are in the Pacific. It's the largest ge geographic feature on the entire planet. That's how big the Pacific Ocean is. It wins, biggest feature, all right. And it was named by Ferdinand Magellan on one of his uh, round the world voyages in 1520. Pacific actually translates to peace because fortunately for Magellan, he had a very peaceful passage which was not the fate of all the sailors that attempted to cross the Pacific Ocean. The Atlantic is about half the size of the Pacific Ocean. It's shallower than the Pacific Ocean, and this separates the old world from the new world of discovery. The Indian Ocean is smaller yet. We go from 26 to about 20.5. It's a similar in depth 
to the Atlantic, but it is only in the Southern Hemisphere as to where the Pacific and the Atlantic span both Northern and Southern Hemispheres. On top, we've got the Arctic Ocean. It's a small fraction of the size of the Pacific, about 7%. For total world's oceans, it's about 3.4. It's the smallest, it's the shallowest, and it is covered with a permanent layer of sea ice, which is really important for sustaining global climates and for sustaining global sea level elevation. As mentioned, we've got the Southern Ocean. It's also called the Antarctic. It circumnavigates the Antarctica. It's really the parts of the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans south of about 50 degrees south latitude. But for all intents and purposes, we could also identify it as its own thing going on. Okay. Earth has a lot of water, and of all the water in the ocean, in the trees, in you, in me, in the ground, in the air, over 97% is in the oceans. That less than 3% then means it's in freshwater, lakes, and rivers, groundwater, and a lot of it here stored in ice. So we have all this water on this earth, most of it in the oceans, a little chunk, 2%, tied up in glaciers, and then small groundwater, 0.6%, atmosphere, lakes and rivers, 0.01. So if you've ever been in a river and you think, wow, this is so much water, in the scope of the oceans, it's really not. It is a drop in the ocean of how much water there is on Earth. And so it's pretty interesting to think about how much water is on Earth, how much of it is salty, there's salinity to our ocean water, and how much is available in freshwater sources. So if we're thinking about the enormity, 97% of the water on Earth is in the oceans. The deepest areas in the entire planet are also in the oceans, specifically the Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench. You will understand this well as you watch James Cameron's uh, Challenger Deep Sea Dive. It's awesome and amazing, and I'm so excited to share it with you. The Mariana Trench is the deepest part of the ocean at over 36,000 feet. Let's compare it to the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building, 2,723. Denver, the Mile High City, 5,280. Relative to this side, which here is the Mariana Trench, Matterhorn, about 15,000 feet in the Alps. Mount Everest in the Himalayas, the world's biggest mountain, the highest point on Earth, could fit inside of the Mariana Trench, and there would still be some space left over. Everest, about 29,000 feet. Mariana Trench, 36,000 feet. So we are talking on scales that are bigger than you and I can even really think about and bigger than is in popular culture. So the oceans are massive and they are huge. The average depth of the Pacific is 4,000 meters. That's deep, over 12,000 feet. The Atlantic is around there too. The Indian is around there too. And then the Arctic is a little bit shallower, 12, uh, 1,200 meters. And then the Southern, you get back into those 4,000 meter depths. So the oceans are deep. To summarize this, the oceans are deep in some places of the ocean, super deep. Okay, now it's time to pause this lecture again. Check out how deep is the ocean. The goal here is to support your learning with animations that back up the slides and the images and the words that I'm speaking to you. So please do that now. Great, so those are some really fun facts about the oceans. Now, let's get into what we know and how we understand them. So we can look at three marine provinces, continental margins, deep ocean basins, and the mid-ocean ridge system. And as you travel from one continent to the other, say from the east coast of the United States all the way over to Africa, you pass through all of these 
marine provinces. Continental margins are shallow water areas close to the shore. Deep ocean basins are the deep water areas further away from land. And mid ocean ridges is a long submarine mountain range, 65,000 kilometers long. In fact, it's the biggest topographic feature of the entire world. The oceans, again, coming through strong, winning some of these various races. The Earth isn't racing each other, but you know what I mean. The oceans are big, vast, and very important because of their size and their depth. Continental margins are the part of the ocean next to continents. Now, there's two different types of continental margins. Where the ocean water meets land at a tectonic boundary, it is an active continental margin. Where the ocean meets land and there is no tectonic boundary, it is a passive margin. So if we think about the United States, the west coast has a tectonic boundary with the Pacific plate on the west, the North American plate on the east. Here near us in Fresno, it is a continental transform boundary where two blocks, two tectonic plates are sliding horizontally next to each other with no vertical displacement. Now we go over to the east coast and there's no tectonic boundary. Therefore, the east coast of the United States is a passive continental margin. So important clarification, continental margins are the areas where the ocean meets land and there's two types, active with tectonic activity, passive in the absence of tectonic activity. So let's look at features <coughs> of the continental margin. We have the shelf, the shelf break, the slope, and the rise. Lots of schematics for us to look at and understand. Let's go piece by piece. So we've got the continental shelf, which is the shallow flooded edge of the continent. Geologically, it's part of the continent, but it has marine sediments on top of it. A whole chapter on marine sediments. It's awesome. Can't wait to share it with you. The average width of the continental shelf is about 43 miles. 43 miles, that's really long. But it varies from very narrow all the way to the Siberian shelf in the Arctic up here that extends 1,500 kilometers whoa 700 miles or so it's a big area remember we mentioned that oceans are big they're really really big so the topography as we can see here from this digital elevation model of shelves is very flat they result from historical changes in sea level and they actually record sea level changes through time awesome it's one way that we can recreate Earth's histories by looking at the age and the size and the depth of these uh, continental shelves. They're created from wave action, the movement of sediments, and they account for about 6% of the ocean floor. Now, they're biologically, meaning life, the richest part of the oceans because biodiversity needs two things to produce. Sunlight and nutrients and continental shelves have an abundance of both of these therefore very biologically active now the continental shelf is relatively flat the continental slope which comes next is going to be steeper and the place between the two is the shelf break it's where there is a marked increase in slope angle and the average depth how deep is this in the ocean is around 443 feet, but again, this changes. The Earth is a dynamic, complex landscape that has so much variability, it's awesome. Now we're talking average, just so we can start to get an understanding, a feeling, but this number varies incredibly. After the shelf is the slope, and this is a steeper portion. Now, how steep is it? Well, on average about four degrees it can vary from one to 25 degrees it's not 70 degrees we just bring in vertical exaggeration to understand and the continental slope extends from the shelf break 
down to about 3,000 to 5,000 meters depth. So 9 to 12,000 feet. It's pretty deep. And then also what's in these continental shelves are submarine canyons, these giant underwater canyons that are carved by uh, subsurface currents, sediments, rocks, and they create amazing features like the Monterey Canyon right here on the coast of California. It's basically a grand canyon that's carved into the continental shelf right underneath the water. Maybe we've been to Monterey Bay Aquarium, we've looked at the sea otters, they're so cute, I love them, but we don't think really, oh, what's out underneath the water there, geologically speaking, uh, oceanographically speaking. And what it is, is it's a huge canyon carved by turbidity currents, which are landslides of sediments and rocks. It's very narrow, it's very steep to overhanging walls, and it is a prominent feature of continental slopes. So cool, I have another video, Monterey Canyon, a grand canyon beneath the waves. Please, please pause this video, check this out. This is awesome. The Continental Rise. This is a transitional area between continental crust and oceanic crust. Now this is another plate tectonics concept. The Earth, plate tectonics, the Earth is covered by rigid chunks of lithosphere. And there's two types, oceanic and continental. Oceanic are heavier and uh, sink to the bottom of the ocean. Continental are lighter and are lifted up above the oceans. So much on that to come. Now, submarine canyons cause turbidity currents that will deposit into deep sea fans in what is known as graded bedding of turbidite deposits, where it's thick, thin, 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 thick, thin, 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 thick, thin, thin, thin. There's a very common deposit in this specific environment. So when we see these rocks in other places, we can infer past depositional environments. We can start to recreate the story of what did the earth look like in its history. So, <clears throat> so your continental margin project, diagram one, create a diagram. Use construction paper, scissors, glue, um, whatever you might have. I'd love to show you what mine looks like. Okay, here we go. My continental margin. You can see it's got a continental shelf, a shelf break, a continental slope, a continental rise. I put my name on it. I'm interested in seeing what you produce. Use the materials that you have at home to create a diagram that includes all of these components here. Thank you very much. Abyssal Plains. So now we're moving from continental margins to deep ocean basins. And in the deep ocean basins, we have abyssal plains. They extend from the base of the continental rise to the mid-ocean ridge. They are the deepest, flattest places on the planet. And that's because of marine sediments and the way that Light sediments settle out of suspension and lay down flat over all these years to create the Adyssal Plain. There's irregularities in the seafloor, but over time, sediments, marine sediments, settle into the deep ocean basin and cover all of them up. From mid-ocean ridge to, I'm sorry, from Abyssal Plains to the mid-ocean ridge, we have the longest mountain range in the entire world. And mid-ocean ridges actually have an elevated profile. So we move from flat deep ocean basins up to the mid-ocean ridge. This has to do with the plate tectonics, again, of a divergent zone. They are made of lava, volcanic rock. 
and we usually see pillow lavas and hydrothermal vents associated with them. I will be discussing more of those, but if you're interested, if you want to Google something today because you're like, oceans are cool, Google either pillow lavas or hydrothermal vents. Check them out. I will teach them because they are that cool, just not for this lecture. So here we can see Atlantic marine provinces. This is North America. This is Africa. And we have all the provinces along the way. The continental margin, the deep ocean basin, the mid-ocean ridge. Back to the deep ocean basin, to the continental margin. And so we see these provinces from one side to the other. Continental margin, deep ocean basin, mid-ocean ridge. <clears throat> so your next diagram that I would like you to create is of marine provinces. So it has these three, continental margin, abyssal plain, mid-ocean ridge. You can use anything in the lectures, the lecture slides, the reading to help you figure out. I'm interested in your creativity and how you are going to create this second diagram and this aids in your understanding for what this actually is. All right, so the next way we can divide the ocean, now we're talking about <clears throat> the marine environment, is through these uh, divisions of open sea and the sea floor. So two words, pelagic and benthic, and they go like this. Benthic is the bottom of the ocean, and organisms that live there are benthos. Everything else in the open ocean is the pelagic environment. So I'm going to zoom out and we'll zoom in and get more granular on each slide. Benthic is the ocean bottom. Pelagic is the open ocean. Now, let's focus on pelagic. So we'll put benthic aside. There's near shore and there's offshore. The near shore open ocean or pelagic is neuritic. The offshore of open ocean or pelagic is oceanic. So if we're talking about biozones, we've got neuritic and oceanic, and they vary with depth. Epipelagic, mesopelagic, Bathypelagic, abyssopelagic, hadalpelagic. Okay, we're getting more complex. We're getting to a lot of uh, classification here. So let me start over. Benthic is the bottom. Pelagic is the open ocean. Let's put benthic aside. In pelagic, we have neuritic and oceanic. In oceanic, it varies by depth. These depths correspond to light zones, 0 to 200, euphotic, it's the epipelagic, 200 to 1,000 meters, mesopelagic, 1,000 to 4,000, bathypelagic, abyssopelagic, 4,000 to 6,000, and below that is hadal pelagic. Now the benthic environment. So we're putting pelagic environment aside, and we're moving on to the benthic environment. It's also divided up <clears throat> into supralittoral, above high tide, littoral from high tide to low tide, sublittoral from low tide to the shelf break. Remember, this is the bottom of the ocean. Let's go deeper even still. We've got bathial from uh, the shelf break to 4,000 meters. This is including the continental slope and the continental rise. We've got abyssal, which goes from about 4,000 to 6,000, right? And this is most of the abyssal plain. And the deep ocean basin is huge, so this is actually about 80% of the marine environment here, the benthic environment. And then below that is the hadal. This is in the bottom of trenches that are super deep, like the Mariana Trench. Perfect. So your marine environment project is to use construction paper, all of that include pelagic, benthic, neuritic, oceanic, and I'm going to show you my 
demo here. So I've tried to recreate this, and I have all of the divisions. Epipelagic, mesopelagic, bathypelagic, abyssopelagic, hadalpelagic, littoral, sublittoral, bathyol, abyssal, hadal. I've labeled the benthic and the pelagic, the neuritic and the oceanic. And here is my marine environment diagram. I would love to see what yours is. Please don't limit your creativity. This is an art project because there is art in science. I do a lot of hand waving. I tell a lot of stories. These stories are founded through scientific investigation, but in order to even think about these things, a lot of creativity and imagination has to go into asking these questions. So there's two objectives here. One, we really understand we feel the intersection of art and science. Two, this is a great way to learn this content because there's a lot here. So I would love for construction paper, but if you don't have any, at the very least, colored pencils or crayons. These are artistic diagrams. You're not graded on the skill level of your arts, but I do want to see effort that goes into these. Great study guides, really, really important. So in conclusion, the oceans are really important in the Earth system. They're important to understand because everything on this planet, including you and me, are connected directly to the oceans. The oceans are super big. They cover m most of the Earth, 71%. They're, they've got the deepest places, the biggest mountains, the most water, pretty much all the water, 97%. They are an enormous feature on the surface of the Earth. And oceans are categorized and classified into lots of ways. Marine provinces go further into continental margins. And marine environments, is the, and this is just the beginning, we will continue to learn terminology, to communicate and understand the language of science, and specifically this uh, dialect that we're now starting to develop called oceanography. So with that, thank you for your attention. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed it. This is our introduction to the oceans, and we are set up for success to learn so much, and I'm excited.